There we go. Right. I have a second screen. Hi, everybody. Hello. Hey. Hey. Hello, Facebook. We're just going to give people a couple minutes to join us. And folks are starting to come in. And I uh, see um, before we get going, thanks so much for joining us tonight for Live at Five. It's actually been a full week since I've done anything, any extemporaneous video or whatever about um, about what's currently happening in our country slash culture um, and even homes. And so, um, but it's good to be back. And so we'll continue to kind of give people a couple minutes to come in. Um, wave and let me know that you're here or at least comment in the comment section here to let me know that you've joined us. That would be great. We'll also be taking questions live there um, in the comments if you want to um, ask any of our panelists or mamas anything um, that you can feel free to do that as well. All right. You know, there's always this moment where it's like, is anybody going to come to my party? <laughs> we're here. We're the party. Yes. Right. It, party we, will the, we will be the party of four if need be. We'll carry yes. this party. <laughs> well, we're not the party of four anymore. People are starting to join us. I'm getting a couple comments. Right. Yeah. Amanda Gillette, who is uh, one of the podcast interns for Being the Dots, is here along with Tomas Torres. Um, and then there are more people than that, but that's what, those are the folks who have commented. Yeah. And we'll start at 505. So we'll give it people about two minutes. Hello, thanks for coming. Go ahead and um, say something in the comments. Let me know that you're here. Let us know that you're here. That would be awesome. See folks just kind of coming in gradually, which is great. It's really wonderful. The last time we did this, it was uh, for Juneteenth. And it was, and I still love being black, uh, which was a really great uh, conversation in the midst of what was a really difficult time. And so that was great. All right, one more minute. But it's live because I did see it on my second screen. <clears throat> All right. Hi. Hello, everybody. My name is uh, Dr. Stacey Kirsten Wharton, aka Dr. Stacey, and I am the host of the Being the Dots podcast. Being the, Being the Dots podcast is a podcast for people of color, uh, created by a woman of color, uh, me, and uh, our goal is to really uh, share the stories and narratives and success and triumphs of people of color who have thrived in white spaces. Uh, tonight, we are doing a bonus episode that is actually complement to an episode that will be premiered uh, next week. The, the podcast itself will drop next week, July 5th at 5 p.m. And um, and one of the episodes that is part of the premiere set is, a, a, is an episode about children. And, and it's made of children's voices telling their stories of their reactions to the George Floyd um, murder. And I thought it would be good to talk to some mamas of some babies um, because what came up for me as I was uh, basically doing it and editing um, the, the episode is how are parents managing this? What are people doing uh, to kind of help children deal with this? That it's a lot. And um, especially some of the babies, uh, one of the babies, one of the most poignant uh, child was eight years old. And when asked what he thought should be different, he just wants black white people to stop killing us for no reason. Um, and that's a lot. That's that's weighty for yeah. a year old. Yep. Yeah. And so I'm gonna stop talking for a moment uh -huh. and allow uh, my guests to introduce themselves. If you uh, welcome, welcome to the live cast. Um, please comment in the comment section. Just say hi, let me know that you're here. We'll also invite you to uh, ask any questions that you'd like to tonight. And why don't we start with Adisher Davis. Why don't you tell us, um, Adisher, if you would, uh, maybe where you live and how old your children are. Sure. Well, my name is Adisher Davis. I live in Powder Springs, Georgia, which is about maybe 20 miles from Atlanta, from downtown Atlanta. And I have two beautiful black boys, uh, one named Zimri, who's actually 13, and my youngest, his name is Desai, and he is five years old. Great. Dr. Hudson Banks. 
Hi everyone, Dr. Kira Banks, and I am in St. Louis, Missouri, and I have uh, boys as well, 10 years old and 13 years old. Bless you. Nicole? Hi everyone, I'm Nicole Purcell. I live in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, and I have two adult children. Jordan, my son, uh, is 22, just graduated from college. And my daughter, Sydney, is 20. She will be 21 in August and a senior in college. Awesome. And I'm Dr. S I am Dr. Stacy. I actually live in Pennsylvania. And I have two bonus children. Well, I have three bonus children, but two boys, um, David, who is 31 and 32-ish, and Elijah, who is 30. And, uh, and then the baby girl, of course, who is 25, Brianna. So why don't we just get into it? Um, why don't we start with talking a little bit about prior to any of the, the, the most recent civil rights movement and disturbance, what were you teaching your boys and children about race and racism? Yeah, I, we started talking to our kids pretty young about race and, and it's uh, in some ways I'm biased because it's what I study. So it was a topic of conversation, but when they were young, we wanted to make sure that they understood and had a foundation that, that being black was beautiful and that we knew they were gonna come up against barriers in the world and they would hear about our blackness in the United States framed as, as only about the period of enslavement. And so we wanted to make sure that they understood that slavery interrupted our history, was not our history, and that they understood not just black people in the United States, but also the history of black people on the continent. Um, whether it's that, I remember my youngest was really into math. We used to teach him about the advances in, in mathematics that they had in, in Egypt and and tried to just share with them that that the continent was the birthplace of, of, of humans and to, to honor and revere our blackness and to almost like try to fill them up with those ideas before they entered into formal schooling and the world when we knew there would be so many withdrawals around their blackness. So before we talked about racism, we just tried to make sure that they had pride in being black and that they were exposed to a whole host of ways of being black so that they knew that it wasn't monolithic and that it was a source of pride. Awesome, thanks for that. What about you, Nicole? Um, I think moving from New Jersey, from the, an urban, quote unquote, urban area out here to, um, I call it Hoogville. Um, it was it was a sort of a culture shock. They were still relatively young. Old Jordan and Sydney. Jordan was just um, entering kindergarten. Mm -hmm. I think when he came home, I remember this day so vividly. When he came wow. home from school, his first day of kindergarten here in Carlisle, he said a little white boy came up to him, mm. not not just hello, how you doing? My name is so and so. It was yo, what's up, man? How you doing? Blah blah blah. Yeah. And oh. Jordan was like, hi. <laughs> <laughs> So I think that culture shock for him was like, why, why did we have to be all that extra, you know, what, you know, so that, I think that's when the conversation started with him. With how, old was he, how old was he, Nicole? Five, six years old, mm -hmm. somewhere around there. Mm -hmm. um, just again, to tell him, you know, we gotta, as, as Dr. Kira was saying, just putting in him that, you know, you can do whatever you want to do, Jordan. You can be whatever you want to be. He, he, we've come a long way in this country, you know, as black people and the things that we've done and the things that we've invented and everything that's that basically that we use as human beings. We probably had something to do with it being into um, existence. Um, just giving them that background. And with Sydney, it was around the same age, I think, that she realized that her hair wasn't the same as the little white girl's hair. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And she couldn't understand why she couldn't 
you know, her hair was, was different. And that's when we had to say, okay, look, let's, let's sit down. Let's talk about it. Your hair is just as beautiful. Actually, your hair is way more versatile. You can do all kinds of stuff with your hair um, that other people can't do. So that's, I guess that's how we started introducing it into their psyche that they could understand at the time. Awesome. What about you, Adisher? I'm glad I mentioned my youngest because she's joined the um joined the live stream. Hi, Brianna. Hey, Brianna. <laughs> For me, I think it was an experience almost similar to what Nicole said. Um, growing up right outside of Philadelphia, PA, and then relocating here to the South was a very different experience for me. So I kind of understood it was going to you know, shape some experiences with my kids. And I think Zimri, my oldest son, was in pre-K. Mm. Always, always been fair skinned. I'm kind of fair, him fairer than I. Um, I think it was the first time that someone said to him that he was different. Mm. and the different kids didn't get to play at their table. So I looked at that as a great opportunity to explain to him what they attempted to say and to try to combat what different actually is. And I, I asked him at that point, try to get an understanding of what he thought different was. So he said, is it because I'm bigger? They said He said, because I'm different, I can't sit at the table. But what does that mean? So I said, sweetie, just to let you know, you're African-American, you're a black boy. I said, so you are different and let's talk about why you're different. So that kind of opened the door for the conversation and me to just kind of feel out where he was with that and to take that journey and take that walk with him and to let him know that your difference doesn't make you less, you're, you're equal. And let's talk about how to start dealing with some of those kids who try to make you feel different. Mm. Um, and treat you differently because they say you're different. So that that started the conversation with he and I. Um, with the size a little bit, like I said, he's he's coming in so young. He doesn't have an opportunity to be but so small. You know, there's conversations around race, around a lot of things that are happening now that he's kind of hearing a little bit more of. So he knows that he has brown skin and, and he'll, he'll talk about different hues and he knows the differences between himself and some of the classmates that are Caucasian as far as in his skin color. But we're trying to be more, um, I guess, take a more hands-on approach with him to explain to him who he is and his heritage, teach him about our culture and let it not be an experience, kind of open the door for him. Mm-hmm. But it's, 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 it's been a journey and a process again, trying to put it in a language that makes sense for a five-year-old. Yeah, and Stacey, I don't, if it's okay if I can jump in there? Just that in all of our comments, what's what's a reminder is that we don't get too much time to just explain to our kids who they are. So quickly they have the experiences with, of racism. So you all were just reminding me that my five-year-old in kindergarten, he came home and he said, so-and-so said that she's gonna marry me. And I was like, all right, all right, next couple of days. Well, so-and-so said she can't marry me because black people and brown people can't, or white people and black people can't be married. And I said, oh, really? <laughs> so that gave us a, ter- a chance to talk about, about these, these laws. Because I said, so you know that's not true, right? And he said, well, yeah. And he mentioned some people in our lives that were couples that were interracial couples. And I said, you know, but there was a time where there, was, there were laws that said you couldn't be married. And so we talked a little bit about again, how laws and people's hearts and minds hadn't caught up with the laws changing. And isn't that unfortunate, but that, that is, that that's a remnant of our country doing things that were unfair. And even though we technically can do it now, there's some other, some people who still don't believe it's okay. Mm-hmm. Yes. Who? Well, and it's, 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 I think what, what's uh, inherent in all your stories is that, um, the age of innocence is oftentimes uh, messed with so quickly. Uh, there's a study that that they um, did kind of longitudinally with a group of white uh, co-eds and they had them look at um, black boys and white boys and they saw them as the same uh, for a number of years until they got to be age 11. And that's when they started to see the young black boys as criminal. So how old is who? How old is your? How old are your boys? We, I have ten and thirteen. Ten and thirteen, and so so he is. I'm certain, innocent and uh, clueless in his own way. And well, uh, 
you're right. You make me think about one day he was headed out to do the trash and uh, we live in the city. And so he was going back out to the alley and, and we have some greenery, but there's also, you can see this one of a busier street. And uh, he said, there was a man who was watching me. And so I came back in the house in a way that I don't think he knows where our house is. So we're safe. Like he was protecting us. Wow. Like there was this bad guy who was trying to like maybe see, and I, and I didn't say anything to him, but I'm like, babe, he was probably looking at you like, who's this black boy in this neighborhood where I don't expect to see a black boy. <laughs> and so you're right, like that he's right at that cusp where he's getting taller and people are making assumptions about his age. Mm -hmm. and, and that innocence is, it's fleeting. Yeah. Fleets extremely fast. And I have that conversation with my son often. You know, it is a couple of different ads that I was watching even on the social media sites and said, you know, when did my son become a monster? And you, you do kind of look at that, you know, at a smaller age, everything is innocent. It's a lot of naivete involved in it. But there is this transition in the eye of society that they they change from babies into something else, especially mine, because he's extremely big and tall for his age. Yeah. So I feel like I've lost some of that now, even at 13, you know, he's my baby, but in the eyesight of society, if you saw him, you wouldn't think he was 13. And just imagining what other people, other people see when they see him, especially other races. So. Yeah. yeah. Right. Samir Rice was 12 playing mm -hmm. in the park, mm -hmm. cops and robbers. Sure. Playing cops I mean, and robbers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like every other little boy, like <laughs> cops and robbers. Right, right. Green. Right. And some girls. And it just, right, exactly. And this, um, to piggyback off of what um, Adisha was saying, how um, you see the social media posts and the images and the photographs. And I, I remember seeing with all the protests going on, there was a little boy. He was so cute. And his sign said, when. At what age do I stop being cute and yeah. become a criminal or a target? You know, and it's, that stopped me in my tracks and was like, why, why, why do we have to have these conversations with our children? Yeah. yeah. And that, at that young of an age, all of us have a shared experience with our five and six year olds. Come on. But it's, you know, the, the onus is on us to have the conversation. No, it shouldn't be the, on us to have these conversations to protect our children. Indeed. It's crazy. So did your children, how did your children learn about the George Floyd murder and the video? Jordan and City are always on their social media. Mm -hmm. Almost four seven. Mm -hmm. um, so they they got it instantaneously when it was uploaded or whatever. They got it. Oh, in the moment. Mm -hmm. In the moment, and they they both came into my room and was like, "Mom, have you seen this?" Wow. Mm -hmm. And I I couldn't watch it at first when they brought it to me. I was like, "I don't want to see it. I I can't." Mm -hmm. And I had to do it in my own time. Mm -hmm. But they have they have been amped up. <laughs> since they watched it, they have they've taken this personally. As and, and it is personal. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And for me, so the 13 year old, I don't think he knew about it immediately, but he does have some social media. So he's on Instagram. And so uh pretty quickly he there was a petition. And so he was like, Mom, do you know that there's a petition that there was a black man that was killed? And because he knows the work that I do. Sure. Um, and the younger one, I checked in with him because he doesn't have access to the same social media. And so I wanted to know if he knew what had happened. And he said that he heard that something had popped up on YouTube about the story and he quickly moved beyond it. So I don't think either of my children, they haven't seen the video. Hmm. And uh, yet I also should share, you know, we're in St. Louis, Missouri. Mike Brown was killed. Mm. You know, my kids were five and three and six, seven. And I, I can't do the math that fast. Right. But they were old enough then that they, they are well aware that this is a pattern. Mm -hmm. And so while they, of course, know George Floyd's name, they also know the larger pattern that's been going on because they were we were engaged 
in the Ferguson Commission and in, my, in the uprisings in Ferguson, Missouri, they went out to protest with us. So they have a different frame, I think, than some kids who are kind of waking up to these inequities in this moment. And in some ways I feel proud in some odd ways that like my kids get the systemic nature of it. And in other ways, I, well, my, old, my older one said, but mom, is anything gonna change? Because what changed after Mike Brown? That there are some ways in which I feel really sad that like at the age of 13, he's already seen a cycle where we get hyped and vocal for a period of time and then people go back to business as usual. I think is that is that your house happening? Of, of course, my house is never ever quiet. No, give me one second. Well, I, this is real parenting in the moment. Like it's like we staged it. <laughs> one second. All right. I um, wonder if any people from uh, just wanted to remind people that they can feel free to put questions in the comments. Um, and if you want a panelist to address anything for you. All right. And there we go. Okay, back from my uh, my personal commercial break. <laughs> <laughs> but no, um, same, same thing. I think Zimri, my oldest son, he actually saw it first. Mm -hmm. uh, we well, just saw a clip, he didn't see it in detail. And he asked me, mom, did you have an opportunity to see did you see what the cops did to that man? Oh my God, that's crazy, mom, you gotta watch it. So, and he literally stood there to watch me watch it. And I said, just give me a moment because I wanted to be able to sit with my emotions. I don't think I was ready at that point to give him my raw reaction. So I asked him to just give me a second and let me take a look at it. And once I sat with how I felt about it and kind of got my emotions to a place where they weren't as raw, because it was hard to watch. It was extremely hard to watch. and. Um, once I got myself to a good place, we talked about it and it just opened up a dialogue and I don't want to jump too far ahead because I know there's some other questions, but just his feelings about police, his feelings about, you know, whites. There, there were so many, it was just layered. It so what did layered. he say? We, we can just segue right into that. What, what, you know, what was his reaction? He was like, why, why white police always do black people that way? He wasn't even doing anything. He, he from start to finish, he wasn't resisting other than saying he couldn't breathe or calling out for people. Like, what was he doing that they felt like they needed to treat him like that? Like, why was he, like, this man was just on top of his neck. Like, why, why would you, you, I wouldn't even do that to a dog. I, I mean, he literally just ran off how I was feeling. And I wouldn't even do this to an animal. Why would they do this to another live person? And it jumped from there to see, that's why we don't like cops. I said, well, who's we? He said, well, black people, that's why we don't like cops. So I said, well, okay. I don't think we've ever had a deep conversation about my personal feelings about cops. But he said, that's why we don't like cops because they don't like us. So then that was a whole nother topic. And I, you know, began to ask me, what do you, what do you feel like when you see a cop? I'm not afraid, I'm angry because I know I'm gonna always do something wrong and I could do all the right things and he could still do me like he did George Floyd. And I couldn't, it took a lot to process that, that my 13 year old who's never had an interaction with the cop can say, I can do everything I'm supposed to do and still end up that way. And that was a wake up call for me because to me, I felt like there was nothing that I could do as a parent to speak to him to say that's not true. Cause it's true. And then he has to Right. I mean, and that's the thing. Like, I think we sometimes don't give our kids credit. Like, oh, yeah. hey, right. He he got it. And it's interesting because I think my kids sometimes get tired of hearing me talk about systemic issues. So I enrolled them in uh, there's the Freedom School. Freedom Lifted in Chicago is doing an online course on the history of policing and visioning a world without it. And it talks about the history of policing mm. in a way that really helps kids understand how it started. And if we think about in the United States in particular, like policing started as a as a tool to police the black body, to keep That's people right. who were enslaved, right? And and it, it even got other white folks who were not in positions of power in terms of like being landholders involved in catching slaves, right? Like. So it pulled everyone into this idea that the black people need to be controlled. Mm -hmm. And it even took it back to the history of policing in, in, in the UK and talked about the dynamics there. And it, it, I learned a lot and it made, me, it made me understand that that feeling that they get, that gut reaction that they get, 
like all the history that's behind it and for them to understand like the, actually their grandfather is a, was a police officer he retired from the state police so they understand that it's not just about individuals that it's about the system and that the system is broken mm. how did your kids respond um to george floyd um in the video kira I mean, they, like I said, my youngest, he said, I'm not watching it. He's like, it just makes me sad. I don't want to watch it. I don't want to think about it. And then every once in a while, like he'll be skipping around doing his chores and he'll say, it makes me sad that I could, like that could happen to me. <laughs> and then you have to, as a parent say, well, of course we'll do everything we can so that that doesn't. And then, but you don't want to be a liar. Right. <laughs> I think that was the hardest part in my conversation, not to cut you off. No, you're good. He said it and it was true. And there was nothing I could say to refute the truth of what he said in the moment. Mm -hmm. You know, I think a lot of times we do want them to, you know, grow and learn truths. But it's some things you just don't want that to be a part of their reality. You know, of course, our kids are 13. They'll be driving soon. I, I don't want that that fear or that anger to be met with racism and you, you know you put those things together and it could be a dangerous mix so you know i told zimmer he was absolutely right but still telling him we still have a responsibility to do what the right thing is to do you know so when he continued to go on in a conversation about he said mom and then the people that were just standing there i mean he's an adult he's a grown man why wouldn't he even listen to the people if he wasn't listening to floyd nobody could get him to stop it's fellow the officers Nobody could get him. I mean, he, he really, really went on some t some time and say, Mom, it, it had to be evil for this man to just do this and not think, oh, this is a human being. At some point, let me get up and give him an opportunity to breathe. And just the fact that he saw that, Mom, it, it was just evil. It has to be evil. Why would a person do another person that way and it not be evil? So I think that was another point that resonated with me that he got that early, that it there was a there's evil. There's a lot of different things, a lot of different adjectives we can use for racism, but specifically just 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 evil, just evil, evil and inhumane. And Hold on one second, Kira. Nicole, you want to jump in here, and we'll come back to you, okay, Kira? Yeah. Um, just just listening to the ladies and and thinking back to when Jordan and Sydney were younger, when the whole um, Trayvon Martin event um, happened, Sydney was in late middle school, first couple of years of high school or whatever. And I think, you know, I've had, the, we've had the conversations with her about stuff happening and, you know, but I think that episode really triggered her that she finally understood what we have been trying to, to tell her. Um, that, like you said, we can just be doing everything, minding our business, walking home, with a bag of Skittles and a, a a juice and end up dead because somebody perceived you as a threat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So then you gotta, that we have to have the conversation. Okay, when you guys go to Walmart or to the Target, take your hood off. When they, you, you know, you're buying something and they ring you up, put it in a bag. Why, why we have to put it in a bag? Just, Tell them to put it in a bag because then that perception is that you stole that. So then, you know, it's justified for me to call the police and for the thing to just escalate. So, you know, the, then there's the, it, it's this one thing after it's the Mike Brown and then um, it's so many names. Um, Orlando still. Well, you know, and then Gardner. all of those people, and they see this, and you don't think your kids, are, for those that are watching or, or um, commenting or, you know, participating in this, please understand, your kids may not say anything. They hear it, they see it, and they feel it. And we, it's sad that we have to try to come to some understanding to answer their questions. But a lot of times we can't, we don't know because we're just as confused and angry and hurt. You know, um, I remember when I finally did break down and watch the George Floyd video. 
as a black mother, as a mother, not even black, as a mother, when he called out for his mother, I could, my heart broke and I sat and I sobbed. Because mm. I, you know, there's, we know as, as adults growing up, we knew there was one person on the planet that would move heaven and earth to help us, to save us, to love us, and that's your mother. And if you call out for her, she's gonna come running. And in that moment, he called out for her, knowing she wasn't there. She's been gone for a couple of years by then. But he called out and I I I broke. I broke and I, I said to Jordan and Sydney, I can't even imagine something happening to you guys, but I need you to be conscious of where you are, who you're with, what the, and I'm, every time they leave the house, even at 22 Absolutely. and almost 21, every time they leave the house with their friend, y'all be safe, y'all pay attention to where you are. Just please, because I don't want to be on the other end of this. So we got a question. Kira, did you want to jump in? Or you want to hold it? You know, I, I can hold it. Let's okay. What the right. questions are. Yeah. All right. So um, this is from uh, Rachel, and she says, um, raising my son in a predominantly white community with a white stepfather has made him very colorblind up until this point. I felt the need to educate him on a level that is inconceivable, unconceivable to his stepfather, an idea of any ideas of how to educate um, not my son, but my husband. Mm. History. He needs to understand the history. So if he needs to listen to the 1619 podcast or watch 13th or read Stamp from the beginning, he needs some education and some backstory. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, my suggestion is to, inc I encourage folks when, to think about and make sure you understand racism as a system and not just individual behavior. Because we could all be real nice, but we can't nice our way out of racism. And those systems and structures would still be in place. And for some people, that helps them. And actually, for research on kids, if kids who understand the system of racism, when they experience discrimination, are better able to not internalize it as being mm -hmm. about them. Mm -hmm. right? that's so that's, good. What, that's what I was going to say, is that it's mm -hmm. sad that we have to do this but it is our responsibility to teach our kids about the system of racism. Like when my kid was eight and he was playing baseball, it, the, it was a city team, so there were a few sprinkles of brown, but we went to play out in the county, no black or brown kids on the other team. And the white kids wouldn't high five our black and brown kids at the end of the wow. game. And so we had to talk about how, you know, that's sad, but that's like their problem. That's not about you. That's because they have been taught things and they are ignorant and they don't understand what they're doing and unfortunately acting in these ways. So I guess I would say it's two pronged is don't be scared to talk about history because as uncomfortable as it might be to look at the hard truths, like that's our history, that's how we got here. And that can help you understand for our, our kids and for this woman's question around her child, for her child to not feel like there's something wrong with me, there's something deficient about me. No, there's something messed up about the world. So let's understand it so that we can interrupt it. There's nothing wrong with you as a, like a human being that is worthy of dignity, but this is messed up. Mm -hmm. And, and as you're, were you going to say something? Hold on. Let's get you off mute. There you go. I just, I just think for the whole, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's not just African American. It's history. It's American history. So it, it's not pretty. Um, it's uncomfortable, but it is history. So in educating yourself, just having a more broad base of understanding what history is. And I know, Stacey, you and I had talked, I think you had put out a survey before about how wh wh where should we start with people? I think there are a lot more people who need to educate themselves. I think it's a disservice that African-American studies is not in elementary schools, that we only have Black History Month where you, you get to pick and highlight only one African-American who's, who's made a contribution when there are thousands of us who've made contributions to society. 
as a whole, um, I, I just think people need to start with taking the time to get educated on what, what our history, our history is. And I think for the question, for them to do it as a family, help each other um, through that process. As you're teaching your son, you also can be teaching your husband. You guys can have dialogues that may be uncomfortable, but educate and grow as a family. I think that's a, 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 a just an important thing to do, period. Well, and it's it's um, I think it's important as well to know and expect that it is uncomfortable and yeah. that the discomfort doesn't equal a lack of safety. And it doesn't mean that you owned people who were enslaved uh, because, uh, as Kira so eloquently said, that racism is a system. And I, I think oftentimes what I'm noticing is that um, people want to disconnect from disconnect racism from what's currently happening, but racism is currently happening. happening. It's still mm -hmm. happening now. And so uh, and so that's important to kind of um, own and uh, help folks through that process and know that it will not uh, be easy. Yeah. Any other thoughts about that question? Keep the questions coming, folks. Just comment. Um, just place them in the comment section and we'll be happy to ask them. I just wanted to say real quick, um, safety. I wholeheartedly agree with both of the ladies that to talk to this young lady's son and her husband about the history and not the whitewashed quote unquote history. Okay. If you're going to tell the story, tell the whole unadulterated story and then let's deal with it, you know, fast forward because you, you can't you can't work through something if you don't have all of the information, all the facts and for too long, we've been fed half of the story. Yeah. Somebody else said, <laughs> and teach resistance. Alexa said, and teach resistance. I like that. And I think teach resistance, not just on the part of Black folks, but the mm -hmm. fact that, and not just to make it Black and white, but there have been white folks in particular who've been fighting against racism since the beginning of our nation's history. Sure. And we don't tell those stories and we don't know those stories. And that's where, mm -hmm. whether it's Tim Weiss or Ibram Kendi or folks who have been really vocal about making sure we name that, that there have been white anti-racist activists, Absolutely. but it serves the status quo for us to not know about them. So, so I, I'm gonna come back to Rachel's comment because I, it's something that I'm curious about, but let, let's go here. Uh, before we come back to that. And folks can keep the comments coming in the comment section as well as your questions. Um, so how, I mean, it's been a very emotional, how long has it been? A month since George Floyd was May killed? May 25th. So yeah, just a little over a month. Um, I guess I'm wondering how, you know, part of parenting is some kind of emotional regulation, right? And so how are you handling your boys or your children and managing your own reaction at the same time? Yeah. It's been difficult. To not, mm -hmm. It's been difficult not to be in a, an emotional state of mourning. And here's why I say, I mean, the incident that happened with George Floyd was a major catalyst. Right. But let's not forget, I hadn't got over Ahmaud Aubrey yet. I was just processing Breonna Taylor and here we are at a, a third incident. So for me, in the middle of the pandemic, in, that was in, the, in the middle of a pandemic, um, dealing with that, it, 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 it's been one thing. It's, it's, I've been emotionally bombarded. I'll say that. And the same thing to have these conversations, you know, with your children, especially, like I said, your teens who are extremely aware, they like, mom, we, we talking about an, it's another incident. My another incident, another. Does it stop? Like when? When are we going to stop having these conversations? And I said that's a great question that nobody knows the answer to, because as you said, we're dealing with racism as a system, and that's been ongoing for so long. How do you break the system? So for me, again, I, I try to compartmentalize. Like I said, we sat down and we we dialogued through a Maude Aubrey and we watched that video and the feelings because we weren't dealing with cops, but we were dealing with vigilante justice, still dealing with, you know, white versus black. 
And then moving into the same thing with policing with Breonna Taylor in that particular in incident with the no knock warrant and talking through that piece. So it's just been it's it's just been a lot. <laughs> that, that's just the best way to put it. Mm -hmm. Trying to take my, my time as, as, as a mother and, and trying to make sure I'm educating my, my children and, and, and praying that when they're at my age, that the stories lessen, that they too don't have to repeat this this cycle of what I say being in mourning as a parent for our society, that they have to go through the same thing with their kids. So it's it's been extremely taxing. My poor husband, because I'm the talker, as you guys can tell, <laughs> he's more introverted and, and, and doesn't, um, we'll come together as a family and share it, but the responsibility to talk to my kids and hear how they're feeling about these things is, is more on me. So I get to deal with the emotional side of it. And I, I tell you, as a woman, we showed her a lot, but it's, it's, it's been tough. It's been extremely tough and trying to detach from it sometimes, trying to cut the news off when there's so much, trying to some, somehow be informed, but still try to detach from it a little bit to kind of give us a moment to kind of somewhat heal, come up for a breath before we're you know punched in the face again with another issue. So when I married my husband 10 years ago, my bonus children, they were grown. And, and, so, um, and so what I find with them now as men is it's hard to do hope installation around this issue. That it's hard to, it's hard to, it's, okay, so you can't say it's going to be okay. Or, I mean, certainly I then go to relying on what my spiritual beliefs are and trying to anchor them into the conversations into something that's bigger than all of us, right? Mm -hmm. But that's all I got. I mean, that's a plenty, but that's all I got for real because um, it is completely overwhelming and hard. I think somebody said, you can't refute them when they say about the police because they're not lying, right? You know, I think I have all of what you're saying that it's been a roller coaster, but I've tried to be, I've tried to take the perspective of just being really honest with them because they were in the house together. So they literally, they see me working. They see me on calls with the black employees of multiple corporations talking about their experience and how they're experiencing similar racism to what their company spoke out against inside their company. Right, like so they're they're around in and out making oatmeal getting some water while i'm doing this work and so i have i think i maybe because of necessity have come to just say you know what we're going to give them a real grounding in what is and then model that you got to get to work like and not just me but like as a society we have work to do so what i loved about this policing class that they were taking is they talked about how basically the findings from the like 1919, 1920 commission report that was put out after Chicago, every other commission report has had the same pattern, the same racialized police violence pattern. And so I'm trying to help them see that we don't have to ask the question if, we know this disparity exists, it's happening. So don't waste your time on that if people are trying to have a conversation. We now need to think about like, how are we intervening in this system to keep it from happening again to another person. And so it's been, I've tr maybe I'm, uh, I'm rationalizing, like I said, because I'm in the midst of it, but I've tried to, in a way, like bring them along in my work to say, yeah, we, can, we can sit with people while they're in shock and awe, and we should be in shock and awe, and what you gonna do? Like, are you gonna march? Are you gonna teach somebody? Are you gonna, what, 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 what you gonna do? <laughs> That's good too, because what that does is it takes the bite out of not the hopelessness but the helplessness portion of it which is really important yes and let yeah. me just say one thing one of my mentors mm -hmm. beverly daniel tatum she said to me because i was asking her this same question kind of mm -hmm. what advice do you have for me what and she said hold on so beverly tatum wrote the, the book that she wrote the book back on the new york tele times bestseller list can you believe that why are all the black kids sit in the cafeteria together? yep why are all the black kids sitting together in the cafeteria if you get That's the old right. version i'm in the back in the acknowledgements okay all right <laughs> so I I right there right i did a facebook live on my dr kira banks facebook page with her conversation just like I we're did. doing now yes she did yes. Yes. yes but you remember what she said and it it has it has resonated with me she said hope is a discipline Mm. It is a discipline. 
Mm. But you don't just get to be like, I'm hopeful and we're done. Like you have to, it is a discipline. It is a practice. And that has helped me as well. Wow. That's deep. That's good. That's that really is good. good. Yeah. It's like every day having to, it to be in it all the time. And I guess that at the same time, holding the reality of what's happening as well. And it, it, it to me, it, that's real. Because I, I talk about being anti-racist as building strength. Mm -hmm. and capacity and so if you think about it, when you want to get strong you can't just lift weight once and be like i'm strong you got to do that right. over time be accountable it's tearing down it's it's like you want to avoid it it's not always pretty but if you want the strength you got to do it and i think in a way what we're saying is like having that hope is similar you got to work at it wow so the comments are lighting up <laughs> um, okay. from that, which is good which is good nicole were you going to say something? Um, yeah, I, I, I'll be honest with you, ladies. When all these incidents happened back to back, the pandemic, and then we learned about Ahmaud Aubrey, and then we hear about Breonna Taylor. After the, the months go by, when those incidents happen, we, you know, we get it all at once. My brain, my heart, my body shut down. Mm -hmm. and I was like in a, in a ball and like they want to go to the store. No, you can't leave the house. Nobody's leaving this house because I can't protect you if you're not right. in, in my grip. Yeah. So no, nobody, <laughs> anything you need, I'll go get it or your daddy will go get it. Or, you know, um, so to, to hear, you know, the ladies talking about their their ways of coping, so that you can help your children cope, is helpful because we know there's going to be a next. There is, there is, there has been a next. We just don't know about it. Right. Mm -hmm. So That's this okay. is helping me to try to, like you said, um, compartmentalize my emotions so that I can help them. They are so amped and ready to do something and they were out marching they've been to a couple of protest marches out in harrisburg and and i went to one here in carlisle and once i could pick myself up off the floor i, I decided to get dressed and go um protest but just it's been hard it's been so hard because you you don't have any answers for their question and that's, I guess that's when the, the feelings of helplessness come in. It's like, okay, if I don't know, how am I going to tell you what, the, you know, what you need to do? And with Jordan, you know, graduating from college, under the, all of this happening, yeah, I'm afraid for him to go out into the world now. Yeah. That the world, now that outside is opening back up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't want to send him out there. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> That's real. That that's that's some real mama talk right there. That that is so real, and I I do. I've been talking about it as a, like a pandemic on top of a pandemic. Yes. And there's a part of me. I said the same. My my uh, 13 year old people ask, "How's he doing?" Because you know some 13 year olds are missing their friends, and he's like, "I could do this forever." Because as long as he he doesn't like all the extra stuff, he'll talk to his friends on the phone, but he can just do his schoolwork and play video games more than he usually gets to because you know, we're home more and he's doing his chores. So I said to someone, I said, I kind of, like you're saying, Nicole, I kind of like it. Like I can protect him in these walls. And if he's okay being here and he's not suffering, like, sure, we can do school at home this fall. Like I can, I can control things a little bit, but I know that that can't last forever. And with yours, they're, they're going out in the world. You hope they launch and get a job after they graduate. So that's, that's right. it's tough. Okay. Right. Yeah. So um, Yolanda Jones just said that um, that her son's college choices have been impacted. And oh, he, yeah. he looks now for colleges in cities that he feels safe. Mm. I'm assuming that one of those is Norfolk State University, Yolanda. <laughs> <laughs> Are we biased over there? No. <laughs> well, Yolanda is my line sister, and we did go to college together, and her parents were Norfolk State graduates as well. So. There you have it. Um, I, mean, I, agree, I agree with that. I agree yeah. with the statement. It does. I'm, and it's so funny. My child is not even college age yet. But best believe we've had this conversation. We had this conversation because Clemson, because mm -hmm. he's a football player, great yeah. school for that, was this has been his number one choice from forever. And I'm like, okay, we may need to rethink some things. 
we need to may we may want to rethink some things as far as and then your comfort level in certain circumstances that you're going to be put in you will be the minority um what that will look like and do you think that you're prepared to handle that because I, I told him I, I have a very unique situation I, I started out at norfolk state my first two years i actually went to school there and then i transferred to um, university of delaware which was division one double a so i went to you know historically black to five percent black so for me I've, I've had both both experiences and while i i, I love the h you know hsbcu feeling the world is not all black and and the sooner that they know how to navigate those spaces and have identity and feel strong and feel comfortable that's my thing that makes a difference. And with my son, I know he's extremely sensitive to things. Um, I just see for him that he may need to make some different choices because you put yourself in a position where you you will be the black guy on the team. You will be the African-American guy in a- He will be, be the dot. It will be the dot for sure. Yeah. And if you're gonna be the dot, there there's just a lot of, education, a lot of information, a lot of affirmation that you need to have to be able to do that. And so for right now, as a parent, until I feel that he's at a place and I know we have some time, I, we had the same conversation. Clemson may not be it because what, what, what do you do? As you said, That's in crazy. So you, you did th that racism. This is why it's systemic, that it changes the trajectory of Absolutely. someone's life, that it tightens choices about where people choose to be educated but and i will say this and then i'm going to we had a question here that i'd like us to answer um that and we're about 10 minutes almost done but um that what what hbcus did for me is that it provided me with those buffers and that teflon so that when i got into these hyper white spaces that my sense of self was so intact that i was good okay yeah. So um, what advice um, do you have for um, for white people to white mamas to support black mamas? How about that? And is there anything that you would that's one of the questions that you would like to share from that? Share Talk about that. to your children. Talk to your children. Teach them teach them the history of racism in our society and teach them how to be interrupters, upstanders, co-conspirators, however you want to think about it. Someone was telling the story, oh, it was, it was um, Dr. Love was talking about uh, the story of Brie Newsom climbing to pull the flagpole down, right? And I should remember the white, you know, the white man's name, but she talked about him being a co-conspirator because he wasn't outside of the of the flagpole area saying, hey, the police are coming. He literally put his hand on the pole to keep them from tasing her. Wow. Which would have been her death, right? Like you tase the oh, pole, oh, she's she's uh -huh. he put his hand on the pole. Wow. He, he did that because he knew how to be a co-conspirator. That was years of work. And so I want my white counterparts to raise their children to be co-conspirators and to stand up in that way because they understand the system. They understand the patterns and they're willing to see the pattern and not get caught up in their hurt feelings or shame or guilt, but they're willing to put those feelings to action. And I tell you what, there are moments like that that are corrective in the sense of i personally I've, I've watched it personally and both in my work as a therapist that when white people are able to use their privilege for good that and especially in a consistent way that there's something about that that's that's healing um, and so it's really important to teach your children but you yourself because i think we have a pretty diverse group here on with us today uh that that when you can do that that is better. I'll just give one quick example. That is my personal pet peeve is that when uh, that you're in a meeting or in a situation and a microaggression happens and somebody does or says something that's sketchy or weird or whatever, racist, homophobic, heterosexual, I mean, just, just off, oppressive. How's that? And, um, and then I sit and I wait for somebody to say something and no one says anything. And then I end up using my voice in that moment, using my social capital in that moment um, 
uh, putting myself in jeopardy at some level, mm -hmm. I say something and then people email me later to tell me that they agreed with me. Oh, I, I know. <laughs> but I can't take it. It's too much. It's, it is too much. T E W much. Okay. <laughs> Serious. And, um, and so, if you want, if you want, that's just a, I mean, at some point we're all going back to work and we're all going to be in the same room together. Yeah. All those crazy stuff is happening on zoom as well, but, um, right. But, but, but please, please white people, please, please, please. If you see something, say something, do not leave it up to the single person, the person who is the dot, the minoritized person in the room to, to be the person it. to say something. If you want it to be different, then you say something. And if yep. not, please don't send me an email after the meeting. I don't want to hear it. Right. Up for me, if you did not send don't, up don't need your public, agreement oh, in public, no, just in go, private. Just, go, just, just, just goodbye. Yeah. And I call that raising equity. You want to raise kids who have an equity mindset so that yes. they can in the moment do that. Yes. Right. We want to yes. raise them. We're rigorous about putting them in the best sports, select this and the oh, best yeah. extracurriculars. But, but re be rigorous about teaching them about social issues. That's what I would ask all of us, but in particular, our white counterparts who could choose to not and could choose to to just float through the dynamics of race rather than to be an active interrupter. Well, and the thing is, particularly given that racism is not the problem of the minoritized. No, it's not. It is not. We did not create this system. No. It is not our problem. And so if it's going to be different, white people, you're going to have to. Start with them. Yeah. I mean, who? I always say, who gave w w women the right to vote? I mean, yes, they only gave it to white women, but it was men. Right. right. So when you have power, you are you are responsible for leveraging that. Yes. And yes. I'm not saying it was easy, but you know, if you've got power in this situation, we're talking about race, white folks, you have that power. How are you going to leverage it? Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the same I, I, so okay. I meant to say, go. We go back to what we were all talking about earlier. Teach it. Teach the history, learn the history, the whole ugly, sad, criminal history. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's I good. just think it's I just think it's some course correction. I think they need to be honest with themselves because I'm gonna be honest with you. There are a lot of people who, especially work in corporate, they are in such denial. And and sometimes I, I you have certain conversations and you like, do you not hear the tone of your statement? Do you not hear what you're saying? I want them to sit first and do a self-inflection and be honest with themselves. Like you said, in opportunities where they could have advocated or spoken of, or, you know, if they've noticed their children um, doing inappropriate or, or, or having interactions, you know, that are wrong. Have you laughed at it? Have you been in agreement? Have you been complicit? Start with you first. And if you know somewhere deep inside of you that you've been complicit or you haven't spoken up, then take the time to correct, course correct, educate yourself and commit to doing better. Because a lot of people I've come in contact with, as we talk about all the time, you know, those statements that make you feel like you're okay with blacks, you have black friends or your children has black friends or there's this token person who you choose to have a relationship with. That doesn't speak to the heart of the matter. You know, when there's opportunities for you to use your voice and advocate and, and, and really make a difference, do you? Are you do you not speak up? Do you speak up? So those are the things for me that do a self-check, do a heart check. And if it's wrong, educate and course correct. That's that's my thought. My that wish. Rhymes. Are you aware that that rhymed? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, so um so we have a few minutes left, and I'm wondering if people want to share um, any last minute advice that they have for parents who are trying to parent black boys and black girls as well in this season of uh, where racism has taken center stage. It's not new racism because it's been there, but that it's taken center stage. We'll start with. Okay, all of you look terribly pensive, so I don't even know where to go. But we're to <laughs> okay, go ahead, Kira. Dr. Kira, go first. <laughs> I'm oh, sorry, I called you out. I apologize. You're good. You're good. You're good. It's not what she does anyway. So she's been preparing her answer for the last 15 years. Right. Whatever she says, 
Nicole said, yep. Nicole said, Nicole said she has a second and a third over here, okay? <laughs> All in favor. <laughs> well, you know, that's a that's a good question. It's hard. And I think my advice would be something I'm still learning myself. So I'm going to say this quickly. Can I say this quickly? Um, if you watched Ava DuVernay's When They See Us, mm. it, I have not cried and gnashed my teeth at a film in the way that I did there. And after I watched that, a shift in me happened as a mom. Mm. I said, I refuse to raise my child from a place of fear from what the world will do to them because I can't control that that mm -hmm. I am going to make sure that they have as much joy and freedom and liberation and feelings of, of wholeness and fullness as I can. I can foster that and cultivate that. And so the advice that I would give you that in the midst of, of course, all the fear that we feel as parents and the, all the ways we wanna control all the things that we, that we remember that our children and we all deserve joy and and we we are such a resilient people that in the midst of this tension and the fight for freedom and liberation that to get to the other side we also have to practice being in touch with that joy daily and so we can't build what we want to be solely from a place of fear and so i have pushed myself to make sure i try to connect with those moments of joy and resilience cultivate that for my boys let them go to the park and fish, let them ride their bikes places where, I mean, I honestly, I'm, I'm nervous for them, but I, I'm excited for them to be able to be in the world and I can't control everything. So that contradiction has been something I've been living in. So my advice, I guess, would be to rest in that contradiction, but to make sure that you cultivate joy in yourself and your children. We deserve joy. That's beautiful. We do. We do. We do. We do. It's one of the comments. Somebody else said, pray, pray, pray real hard. Yes. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, you said you made a good point as well, Stacey. You know, those of us who have a root system in faith, you know, I constantly say all the time that God hasn't given me a spirit of fear, mm -hmm. you know, power, love, and a sound mind. So in that sound mind piece, you know, educating my boys, you know, letting them know their value and their worth, the hard work that I've put into giving them an environment that's better in a sense, more opportunities than what I grew up in. And again, just making sure that they have a strong sense of cultural identity, a strong sense of who they are. And the more that we dialogue, the more that we talk, the more that I hear their heart and I can do my part to influence them to be decent, kind, um, godly human beings. I have to leave the rest to God. And then that's where I'm finding the peace, you know, peace of it all. I'm quite sure, you know, Brianna Taylor's mom didn't expect when her daughter to die at home, sleep from work. You know, same thing, Ahmaud Aubrey's mom never would have had that expectation. Um, but just keeping myself at peace and, and giving that same peace to them because we God holds the outcome. We can't control it, right? Mm -hmm. So just making sure that I'm raising educated, decent, godly young men and leaving the rest to God. That's all, that's all you can do. Mm -hmm. it's good. Nicole? Say amen and ditto sisters. <laughs> because you're absolutely right we have no control over any outside stuff that happens so we have to trust what we put in them and that's the love and the joy and the, the education and the, the, the cultural awareness and the self-awareness and the respect for themselves and and respect for their family and the community and to be giving people everything that we've poured into them, we got to trust that they can use those wings when they leave us. So that's where I am because my two are about to leave me. I that's mean, right. my nest has been empty for a couple of years. They've been home since all of the pandemic stuff, but eventually they are going to leave, and I have to, I have to trust that I've put in them what they need to succeed and soar. And, I would just encourage all mothers, all parents to do that. To just continue to pour into your children, pray over them when they're in your house, when they're out with their friends, and you just trust that they're, they're being protected and, and, and covered. It's beautiful. So I think that it's important to not forget our babies. 
And so while all of this stuff is happening in our world and it's so pervasive and insidious everywhere on every airwaves, on all social media, on just everywhere, I am a non-video watcher. I stopped watching videos with Philando Castile. So I just, it's too much, it's too traumatic for me. But I know enough about what happened in the video that, and just from, just it just being in the general kind of zeitgeist, if you will. And so don't forget to check in with them and talk to them. And you speak truth to them because without that, if you're not talking to them, they're developing thoughts, ideas, and opinions, and you want to make sure that whatever they're developing around us that is informed by your voice and not by Chris Matthews or whomever else. Uh, the other thing that I would note as well is that it's also important, I think, to actively engage in self-care for them and, and, and that fun and fun. Um, and to you create, continue to try to create the space to allow them to be children as it is age appropriate. You don't have children anymore, Nicole, but that, that you protect, even though the outside world, that their child is, is under full attack. There we go. That your child is under full attack. You protect. That's good. That's good. And so I think it's really important. Mm -hmm. I want to thank all of our guests today and remind you all that the Being the Dot podcast is premiering next Sunday at five o'clock with an episode about children and what their thoughts are about the murder of George Floyd, along with um, an episode about how a black woman uses her voice in Hollywood and an episode uh, on the annual black man. And in fact, our guest daughter uh, for next Sunday at five o'clock will be Marcus Burke, author of Team Seven. It's been featured in the New York Times and is a professor at Texas Tech University. He'll be joining us to talk some more about the angry black man syndrome, whether it's a myth or reality or a caricature or a defense mechanism of white supremacy. Thank you so much. Again, make sure that you join us next Sunday and download that podcast, subscribe, rate, and review uh, when, when you get to it as well. It'll be on all platforms for you. Thanks so much. Have a good night. Good night, ladies. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was excellent. You're welcome. Hold on one second.